Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. Today, the 23rd of April is a special day. On this was born the school which uh, grew within two months of the establishment of this ashram in 1956. The school is now known as the Mother's International School. So it's the birthday of the Mother's International School. And even more important, tomorrow the 24th of April is the day on which uh, the mother arrived for the second and the final time in Pondicherry in the year 1920. The day 24th of April 1920 is a very special day in the spiritual history of the world because it was the beginning of an unprecedented collaboration between two spiritual masters, the mother and Sri Aurobindo. And uh, this collaboration was unique in many ways. Two spiritual masters as alike as uh, these two would be difficult to find in history. Secondly, the goal that they set for uh, their spiritual practice and the spiritual practice that they taught to their disciples was revolutionary, was unprecedented. The goal was to change human nature on such a scale that uh, the world itself will become a much better place to live in. You know, before that, uh, the focus of the spiritual disciplines had been <coughs> primarily on the individual. Spirituality is for individual salvation, spirituality is for individual moksha, individual spiritual growth. And uh, of course the individual is a unit of the collective and therefore it will have a collective influence. There will be repercussions on the society as a whole, but uh, that was not the goal. It was taken for granted that uh, so far as uh, humanity as a whole is concerned or life on earth is concerned, that is something that is a given, it will always remain a place of sorrow, misery and suffering and uh, that if those who are wise enough to follow these uh, spiritual teachings live life differently, then they will be able to make their lives happier and uh, also uh, get liberated from perhaps this cycle of birth and death. So that was the way spirituality was looked at. Sri Aurobindo and the mother were the first two spiritual masters to set as the very goal of their spiritual practice a collective element, a collective increase in the rise in the level of consciousness of the human race. And of course the level of consciousness is related to human nature and therefore this rise will change the typical, the average human nature. And the result would be that instead of being ego-driven personalities, human beings in general will become love-driven personalities and uh, that will be the true solution, in fact, to all the problems of human existence, such as uh, inequality, from where flows all the injustice, cruelty, misery and suffering. So that will be the end of uh, these problems of human existence. And that they visualized was going to happen, they gave that certitude. That was going to happen because uh, there was an evolutionary thrust in that direction. And uh, whether human beings want it or not, it will happen. But human beings are in that unique position where they can collaborate with nature and accelerate this process. And uh, therefore, human beings could participate in this revolutionary development on planet Earth. And this they visualized would happen in not too distant a future. Now that is the significance of uh, uh, the 24th of April 1920. One can call it sort of the foundation day laying ceremony of a new world order, of a new type of world. Now I have chosen on this day to talk about uh, the character Savitri in the epic poem Savitri by Sri Aurobindo. Now, just to give the context, uh, in Savitri, the story starts with a king, King Ashwapati. King Ashwapati does not have a child. He goes on a quest, on a spiritual search, on his yoga. But the aim of his yoga is not just to get a child. In fact, 
the aim is not to get a child the aim is something different you know unlike the traditional story in mahabharat where ashwapati performs a yagya to get uh, a child in shorbindo savitri that is not why ashwapati embarks on his yoga his aim is to bring a new level of consciousness to this earth to bring an end to cruelty misery and suffering on earth so that was the goal with which ashwapati starts uh he reaches the very summits of uh, uh union with the divine he reaches the very summits of uh, what one may say is the spiritual practice and uh, the divine mother reveals herself to him and tells him that uh, now he can be satisfied with what he has accomplished where he has reached the progress that he has made but he says that it is not for himself that he is doing all this he wants it for all mankind and she tries to tell him that well that is something which cannot happen because uh, there are certain natural laws the earth has been made for a different type of a destiny and the earth is meant to be a different type of place the earth can't become heaven and so on and so forth so he is given all those arguments but he keeps on pleading and uh, finally the divine mother gives in and tells him that i will send someone to this earth who will do what you want so what you want will happen and for that a very special being will be sent on this earth and that being is sent in the form of ashwapati's daughter savitri and uh, therefore you can now see that uh, in uh, savitri ashwapati is nothing but sri aurobindo himself and uh, savitri nothing but the mother herself because uh, that was uh, the mission of uh, shorbindo's yoga that was uh, the mission which uh, the mother came to collaborate in so that uh, it could be actually accomplished without either of them it could not have happened as uh, you know has been said by both of them that uh, without uh, shorbindo the mother could not exist and without the mother shorbindo's philosophy could not have been put into practice without the mother shorbindo could not manifest so it was the mother who gave uh, shorbindo's philosophy and her philosophy they were remarkably similar but one can even say identical and they were identical even before the mother came to india even for the first time and uh, therefore uh, they were both a twin consciousness but two bodies and these two bodies were there because one body could not have done what the two did together so it was uh, the mother who gave uh, their philosophy that is hers and shorbindo's a practical shape at shorbindo ashram in pondicherry and uh, therefore if one talks about uh, savitri from savitri from the scripture called savitri then we are talking about the mother so what i'll start with is uh, a few lines from the very beginning book 1 canto 1 which can be considered a sort of a preface to savitri and uh, on page 14 in my edition line 129 i think in every edition uh, here is a description of uh, savitri since first the earth beings heavenward growth began through all the long ordeal of the race never a rarer creature bore his shaft that burning test of the godhead in our parts a lightning from the heights on our abyss all in her pointed to a nobler kind since first the earth beings heavenward growth began the earth started as matter then came life then came creatures with a mind and one way of looking at it would be that uh, these were steps towards the heavenward growth of those living on earth since first the earth beings heavenward growth began because uh, it was step by step a little more manifestation a little more expression of the divinity hidden even in matter so it was a greater expression it was an unfoldment so 
when this process be, ever since this process had begun culminating for the time being in man who expressed more of divinity than any other creature so far but then still being far from manifesting it fully uh, since first the earth beings heavenward growth began through all the long ordeal of the race race probably applies to the human race why this long ordeal of the race because of the race struggling to approach the divine which probably creatures came who came before had not tried because they were satisfied as they were it was the human being who had that divine discontent and uh, through, through it first been a long ordeal ever since the arrival of man on earth it had been a long ordeal uh, for this race struggling and yet not succeeding much in changing the character of uh, a typical human being so since first the earth beings heavenward growth began through all the long ordeal of the race never a rarer creature bore his shaft so never before had someone more rare than savitri bore the shaft of the divine sort of at the flag of the divine that burning test of the godhead in our parts now in a way uh, all the parts of which uh, we are made which we manifest on the surface the body and the mind uh, they are an expression of the divine and uh, therefore in a way say that they put to test to what extent we manifest that we truly are so the body and the mind are truly divine but then the manifestation is very little and therefore uh, these parts the body and the mind are putting to test our ability to manifest they are putting to test to what extent the godhead really resides in these parts a burning test of the godhead in our parts a lightning from the heights on our abyss so a rarer creature who went through this test more successfully had not been born on this earth and uh, what was she like on earth a lightning from the heights of on our abyss so from great heights heights unimaginable for those of us on earth from those heights there was a lightning such a strong lightning that some light was thrown also on this earth you know something like those flares you know uh, sometimes if there is an accident say uh, in uh, a dense forest where there no electricity nothing it's all very dark then what they do is uh, from the helicopter they send those flares so that you can get a little view of what is there and maybe if there are any survivors or anything then the helicopter can land there and pick them up so it is like that flare so the mother's presence on earth was like that lightning from great heights on our abyss on our depths hmm? and then comes this uh, great line which sums up in a way what savitri or the mother were about all in her pointed to a nobler kind then uh, on the next page line 155 a wide self giving was her native act a magnanimity a magnanimity as of sea or sky enveloped with its greatness all that came and gave a sense as of a greatened world her kindly care was a sweet temperate sun her high passion a blue heavens equipoise so what was she like what did she do a wide self giving was her native act giving herself giving all of herself came very naturally to her it was her native act a magnanimity a generosity a greatness as of sea or sky you know these are our uh, sort of models for vastness magnanimity expanse so that is the type of comparison one could make a magnanimity as of sky, sea or sky enveloped with its greatness and like the sea and the sky she enveloped with her greatness all that came and gave a sense as of a greatened world so all that came in contact with her all that she enclosed 
all that she enveloped, all that acquired a greater meaning, all that acquired a greater stature. So, a magnanimity as of sky, sea or sky, enveloped with its greatness, all that came and gave a sense as of a greatened world. Since she enveloped the world, the world itself gave a different impression. Now it gave a sense of a greatened world, a world which had been made greater, a world which had been made great. Greatened, you know, has been made into a verb here, great from great, greaten. So, and gave a sense as of a greatened world. Her kindly care was a sweet temperate sun. You know, in winters or uh, in colder climates, sun has a very soothing effect. So her kindly care had that type of a soothing effect. Her kindly care was a sweet temperate sun, her high passion a blue heaven's equipoise. It looks a little contradictory, passion and equipoise. Equipoise is a sort of a emotionally stable, in a state of perpetual, undisturbable, imperturbable peace. But uh, that equipoise was coupled with high passion, which means that there was an intensity of passion, but not the agitation and aggression, which sometimes go with passion. So that was the character of her passion. She was passionately self-giving, passionately magnanimous, but at the same time, it lacked that sort of aggression, that sort of violence which we sometimes associate with passion, the pa it was just the intensity of passion. So her high passion, a blue heaven's equipoise. So in spite of her passion for uh, being generous, for being loving and caring, she had that equipoise, that perfect equality, equality, you know, uh, equality of temperament, uh, equality, which means equal delight, irrespective of everything. So that sort of equipoise she had, which normally we associate with the blue heaven. You know, sky sometimes, we, when the sky is a clear, deep blue, uh, all washed and clean after a rain, you know, that is the type of thing that we can compare with heaven and the heaven's equipoise. Then a few lines later, a deep of compassion, a hushed sanctuary, her inward help unbarred a gate in heaven. Love in her was wider than the universe. The whole world could take refuge in her single heart. A deep of compassion, a hushed sanctuary. So compassionate that she could provide a sanctuary, an asylum, a place where one could seek refuge. Her inward help unbarred a gate in heaven. She helped from within. She helped secretly. She helped invisibly. But what did it do to, to the one whom she helped, who took, the one who took refuge in her? It unbarred for that person a gate in heaven. It opened up a new world for that person altogether. It opened up a world which was full of joy, love and bliss. It was, it unbarred a gate in heaven. Love in her was wider than the universe. Love cannot be confined, it cannot be measured. And uh, in her case, it was wider than the universe. The whole world could take refuge in her single heart. I just read a small sample of the lines. There's much more, but then uh, there's a limitation of time. So what I'll do next is something which uh, is again of great significance to each one of us, and that is what is the type of impact she had on those who were around her. And uh, for that, I'll turn to page 362. which is uh, Book 4, Canto 2. Uh, this is the book uh, which, uh, I mean, this is the canto which is titled The Growth of the Flame. 
The book is the book of birth and quest. That is the book of the birth of Savitri and the quest on which she goes in search for a partner. But this particular Canto Canto 2 is the growth of the flame. That is Savitri growing up during her youth. And uh, even while she was growing up, what is the type of impact she had? One might say that when she came here and we felt her influence, she was much more grown up. But you know, that sort of uh, freedom one has in a piece of uh, literature one is creating. So, but one can see a lot in the type of impact that is shown here, uh, growing Savitri, that is Savitri growing up through her youth in this book, that is exactly the type of impact she had on people around her in Pondicherry. And uh, the responses of those people have also been given here. The responses were also quite similar. And uh, I think it is not just applicable to the disciples, around 100, about, about a thousand disciples she had in Pondicherry itself uh, when she left her body and many more scattered all over the world. But uh, it applies not only to them, it applies also to us because uh, her presence is still there and we are no different from those spiritual seekers and therefore her impact is the same and our responses also fall in the same category. So book four, Canto two, a line uh, 117 onwards on page 362 in my edition. Aware of the universal self in all, she turned to living hearts and human forms her soul's reflections complements counterparts. The close outlying portions of her being divided from her by walls of body and mind, yet to her spirit bound by ties divine. So the impact was because she was aware of the universal self in all. She saw the divine in everybody around her and therefore she turned to living hearts and human forms she turned to them, seeing in them the divine. Her soul's reflections, complements, counterparts, the close outlying portions of her being divided for her from her by walls of body and mind, yet to her spirit bound by ties divine. A very beautiful description of what it is to see the divine in others. We all uh, you know, know that uh, we should be seeing the divine in everyone. But then what does it come to? What does it mean? Uh, how did Savitri do it? She saw in everyone her soul's reflections. She saw everyone as a reflection of her soul. She saw them as compliments. That is those who completed her. She was incomplete without them because the divine is infinite and they added one more element to that completeness. She saw them as counterparts. And then she saw them as the close, uh, please switch it off. Uh, the close, uh, sorry, it was a uh, cell phone ringing. The close outlying portions of her being, she saw them as portions of herself, which were outlying, which means, which were somehow happened to lie outside the boundaries of her body, but actually they were the reflections of her soul, complements and counterparts. The close outlying portions of her being divided from her by walls of body and mind. So they were actually parts of her being, the people around her. It was just they that they happened to be divided from her by these boundaries, by these walls of body and mind. But in spite of this division, in spite of these boundaries, yet to her spirit bound by ties divine. They are bound to her spirit, that is to her essence. Our essence is the soul. So to her essence, they were still tied by ties divine. That is, ties that are divine in character. So it is the divinity that all of these people around her manifested, which was of supreme importance. It was the essence. That is what bound her to everybody around her. And therefore, she is not only sort of uh, saw as a theoretical uh, uh, idea or as a matter of faith, everyone around her, she actually saw in them the reflections of her soul, saw them as compliments, saw them as counterparts, saw them as portions of herself which happened to be physically separated from her 
and that separation was because of the boundaries of the body and mind. So, aware of the universal self in all, she turned to living hearts and human forms, her soul's reflections, complements, counterparts, the close outlying portions of her being divided from her by walls of body and mind, yet to her spirit bound by ties divine. So this is the type of impact she had. And uh, then a little later, what was their response? Only a few responded to her call. Still fewer felt the screened divinity and strove to mate its Godhead with their own, approaching with some kinship to her heights. Their response was not reciprocal. Because difficult for the average person to see everybody else in the same light. They could not even see her in the same light. And therefore, if this can be considered a sort of a call to come and become one, if this could be considered a call to oneness, only a few responded to her call. Still fewer felt the screened divinity. So, although very few responded to her call for oneness, the number of those who actually felt the screened or hidden divinity were still fewer. And uh, because they didn't see her, they did not strive to mate its Godhead with their own. They did not see uh, some sort of a close relationship getting established between her Godhead and their own. Because they did not see the two Godheads as one. They did not see the Godhead in fact in a human form at all. At least not the way she was seeing it. Approaching with some kinship to her heights. So, there was no question of approaching her heights with a sense of kinship, with a sense of being of the same origin, belonging to the same family, belonging to this, essentially to the same entity. That sort of thing was not there. And this actually has some hints you can see of the fact that why she could not really find a mate. And when she could not find a mate otherwise, her father told her, go and look for one yourself. And she goes to the forest and find, meets Satyavan. So why she could not find a mate is because the human response could not match the type of response or the, match the type of attitude she had to others. Such people, you know, can be very easy to admire uh, from a distance, but they can be very difficult to live with. And therefore, one can't blame those people if they did not come closer and want to become her mates in the usual sense. There are a lot more lines on uh, the way people responded, but I'll not go that because if I start reading the original, it is so beautiful that one gets carried away. So what I've done is from those lines, uh, which continue from these lines onwards, I've tried to see what essentially are the type of responses which have been conveyed through those lines. One type of response was that many attempted very enthusiastically to approach her heights. Naturally, since they did have the capacity, they failed and therefore they were frustrated. You see, when we try something which is uh, only a slightly higher than the level where we are, something which with effort is within our reach, then it is a challenge. And we enjoy facing that challenge and uh, overcoming that challenge and getting what we attempt. But if we attempt something which is much beyond our capacity, and yet we attempt it, then what happens? We fail and we, then we get frustrated. So this is what was happening. They attempted very enthusiastically because they were enamored of the heights, but they failed and got frustrated. That was one type of response. What was the second type of response? Slow, patient, diligent, hard work. That was the second type of response. But why they were doing it? They didn't know. The aim, they were not clear about. Because their aim was, because her aim was beyond their vision. But they were quite content to just keep working like satellites of her son. That is the comparison given in Savitri. Like, you know, the satellites which keep revolving around the sun, the way the planet Earth also does, 
Uh, it goes on working year after year. It's slow, hard work. But the Earth doesn't know why it is going round and round the sun. Hmm? It's a satellite. And the moon does the same to us and so on. So uh, we, it was like, she was like the sun and they were like her satellites. They were working hard, but they didn't know why they were working, where they were going, what they were doing it for. Then the third type of responses were, response was stumbling advances on the paths she made. So she created some paths for those who could not create their own path and they just tried to walk on those paths, stumbled, but then kept advancing a bit. Then there was a fourth type of response. They didn't care for anything else. They just clung to her for nourishment, for support. They became sort of dependent on her. Total dependence. They knew that they can't do much on their own. So they just clung to her, got all the support and nourishment from her. They became dependent. What is the fifth type of response? The fifth type of response was uh, like human love, turbid human love. Human love is not clear and pure. Turbid human love, turbid in the sense it is transactional in nature. Uh, I give you this and therefore you give me this. The effort is I give you less, you give me more. Huh? So that is the type of transactional uh, relationship they tried to have with her not realizing who she truly is. And uh, the sixth type of response was, they expected that they will change. They'll change through closeness, through mere proximity. By being close to her all the time, they will somehow change. That reminds me of, uh, this is a joke, <laughs> of a professor of anatomy we had in Ames. Uh, he said that uh, many students carry their books like this, especially girls. He said they, think that uh, they have a capacity for axillary absorption, you know, <laughs> axillary. <laughs> so just as you absorb food through the intestine, these girls think that they'll absorb knowledge through their axilla. So <laughs> proximity. Huh? So that is the type of response, the sixth response they, some of the disciples had. They expected to change by merely being close to her through proximity. Hmm? Now, somewhat closely related to this, then there are more lines continuing which illustrate the type of devotees that they were. These were responses, you can say those are devotees, but there's a big overlap. But anyway, now starts the other series of lines about the responses of those around her, those who can be called devotees. They have been compared to sunflowers. The sunflower turns to the sun, but cannot reach the sun. So they turn to her, did her work as well as they could, as sincerely as they could, and she also helped them choose their path, and they were quite content with it. They didn't expect anything more. They were very happy to just do her work and uh, follow the path that she showed them, and uh, they had just this faith that if we keep doing this, one day, She'll take us where we should be going. So she knows where she, we have to go. She'll take care of our progress. We just have to keep doing, keep working for her. It doesn't matter whether it happens in this life or we have to come back to earth for thousand lives. That doesn't matter. I'm ready for it. I'm happy to work for her. So they were like sunflowers who turned to her the way the sunflower turns to the sun. They were happy to do her work. They chose and they walked on the path that she showed them and they had faith that she will take them to the right place. And uh, their joy was just the joy of being hers, the joy of belonging to her. Mai tera ma, mai tera ma. That was their joy. What were the second type of devotees? The other type of devotees were those who were divided between wonder and revolt. On one hand, they were awed. They were sort of overwhelmed by her majesty. But on the other hand, they also revolted that why should we be doing everything that she tells us to do? Why should we be doing only the work that she wants us to do? So they felt sort of captured. They felt as if they were caged. But at the same time, it was a cage from, they did, from which they did not want to be free. So on one hand, they felt as if uh, they were imprisoned, they were captured, 
but at the same time, if you give them a chance, they were not even wanting to be free. So there was this peculiar combination of wonder and revolt, as Sri Aurobindo has called it in Savitri. Now, these were responses which both, which came out from disciples whose level of consciousness was pretty high. Then comes some a type of responses from disciples whose level of consciousness was a little on the lower side. Now, what was the third types? They claimed exclusivity in the relationship, that she is all only for me. And uh, the comparison Sri Aurobindo has given is that you know uh, the disciples were like satellites, so the earth thinks that all the sun's light is for me. The earth doesn't realize that the sun has many other satellites also, and they also get an equal share of the light. The earth is not even it remains ignorant of it, doesn't bother about it. The earth just wants, I want sunlight. So they claimed exclusivity. Not only that, they wanted her will to bend to suit them. We do it with the divine so often. I'm praying so hard, please do what I want. So we want the divine to bend. We don't want to know what the divine wants from us. So we want to bend the divine. So that was another type of response. Then yet another type of devotees were those who had a great longing uh, for her and uh, they were miserable because she surpassed their grip. They could not have a full control on her. They could not see that they, she belonged fully to them and therefore they were miserable. Then there were those who saw her as someone who is too controlling in nature. They blamed her for of tyranny. But at the same time, this was a tyranny from which they did not want to escape. Just like those who felt caged but did not want to escape from the cage, these uh, uh, devotees felt that she was a dictator but didn't want to escape from that dictatorship. So they blamed her for tyranny but didn't want to escape. Then there were those who were drawn to her unwillingly. Somehow circumstances forced them uh, to be there and to get drawn to her. They were not really willing, they were not prepared for it. And what did they try to do sometimes? They tried to bring her down to their level. Instead of rising to her heights, they tried to bring her down to their level, somewhat similar to, you know, wanting her to uh, will to bend to suit theirs. Uh, some of them wanted to bring her down to their level. And uh, then there were those who were forced to organize their lives around her. It was purely force of circumstances which brought them in those conditions where if she happened to be near them and therefore because they happened to be in a part of that community which was around her, they were forced to organize their lives, lives around her and they thought well if we are doing all this although we don't want to do it, we have been forced to do it, circumstances are forced to do it. What they expected was basically that their ordinary human needs will be met by being there. So, roti kapda makan, wo mil jayega. So, that was their basic expectation and they didn't think much beyond that. So, these are all the different types of <coughs> devotees which in very poetic language Sri Aurobindo has talked about in, this, in these pages, starting with page 363 onwards. And uh, then, you know what, to, uh, uh, let me see, uh, come to how the mother responded to these devotees uh, briefly uh, in general. And uh, that we find on page 366. Line 249 onwards. Although she leaned down to their littleness, covering their lives with her strong passionate hands and knew by sympathy their needs and wants and dived in the shallow wa wave depths of their lives and met and shared their heartbeats of grief and joy and bent to heal their sorrow and their pride, lavishing the might that was hers on her lone peak to lift to it their aspirations cry. And though she drew their souls into her vast and surrounded with the silence of her deeps and held as great mother holds her own, only her earthly surface bore their charge and mixed its fire with their mortality. Her greater self lived soul unclaimed within. So if you see, the f most of these lines in the beginning are those where how she tried to suit them so that she could be of some use to them. The way you know an adult can may be able to play a game very well. But when the adult plays with a child, the adult does not try to play perfectly. 
He may be quite capable of, uh, say, if it's cricket, the adult may be quite capable of uh, uh, the ball going straight to the wicket with, at the very first ball. But then uh, he doesn't do it. He wants the child to have a little pleasure of being able to bat. So, you know, he lets him play. He deliberately doesn't uh, send the ball uh, in the best way he can. So she leaned down to their littleness. But then the adult still knows within what the adult can do. So that's what this. Although she leaned down to their littleness, covering their lives with her strong, passionate hands, and knew by sympathy their needs and wants. So she knew what they wanted uh, and met and shared their heartbeats of grief and joy. She helped them with their joys and sorrows. Sorrows diminished, joys multiplied. And bent to heal their sorrow and their pride, lavishing the might that was hers on her lone peak to lift it to their aspirations cry. So, she used her strength to lift uh, to it, lift to it, lift to it, the lift to the lone peak, and lavishing the might that was hers on her lone peak to lift to it their aspirations cry. So she tried to lift to her lone peak, that is her peaks, the, their aspiration. So she tried to upscale their upgrade their aspiration itself so that they would aspire higher, aspire for more, aspire for something better. And though she knew their souls into her vast and surrounded with the silence of her deeps and held as the great mother holds her own, so she uh, kept them in her embrace, kept them in her lap, held them as a mother holds her children, only her earthly surface bore their charge and mixed its fire with their mortality. So it was only her surface nature on earth, in her earthly existence, that she mixed her fire with their mortality, let it get subdued by their mortality. But within, she knew who she was. So her greater self lived soul, soul, S-O-L-E, soul, alone, by itself, unclaimed, within. So that still stayed. There's a beautiful analogy given uh, to express this type of a situation in a poem uh, in which uh, the poet talks about a cliff. You see a uh, cliff, a uh, very tall structure, something like, you know, like the type of uh, high-rise buildings or um, some very tall structures that uh, we can imagine, like say Kutub Minar. So it was very high, uh, but then uh, it was so high that it went even beyond the clouds. So if you look at the base, it's surrounded by uh, clouds, storms, everything. But if you look at the peak, the peak has gone beyond the clouds, the peak is in perpetual sunshine. So it allows itself to be surrounded by uh, clouds and storms, or uh, in this case, by the ordinary people, and trying to do as much for them as uh, she could, but then that peak still remains alone. By itself, it is soul unclaimed within. That is something which nobody can claim. She stays within her and lives all by itself. And uh, this loneliness which she had, truly speaking, within, which nobody else could perhaps see, is the fate of anyone who is truly great. And that comes towards the end of this canto. Whoever is too great must lonely live. Adored he walks in mighty solitude. Vain is his labor to create his kind. His only comrade is the strength within. Thus was it for a while with Savitri. So whoever is too great must lonely live. Adored, the person is loved. But in spite of being loved by many, he walks in mighty solitude. But truly speaking, he's still in solitude, he's alone. 
Vain is his labor to create his kind. He may want his tribe to multiply, he may want more and more to be like him, but that is a futile effort, that is all in vain. His only comrade is the strength within, his only companion, his only friend is the strength within. Thus was it for a while with Savitri because she was also too great for the ordinary mankind. Now, what was her true mission? Uh, I hinted at it at the beginning. The mission was to change the very character of Earth. And uh, this is something which has come at many places. And all these things that I'm talking about have come at many places. In fact, if one would talk everything about Savitri, from Savitri, perhaps one will have to uh, read more than half the scripture. But uh, uh, I'll turn to the end where she has vanquished the god of death. But then there's one more test that she has to go through. There's a voice from the divine itself who again promises her all the... Uh, peace and joy in heavens if she forgets her mission. So this is a test that she has to undergo. That you can ask salvation for yourself uh, and uh, just forget about your mission. But then she does not forget it. She says, no, I am here for all mankind. I am here to remove misery from this earth. I am not here only for my own salvation. So when she goes through that test, then the divine tells us, as if she has passed the test and therefore tells us that yes, I also want the same thing to happen which you have been saying and uh, you will be my instrument to do it. And that comes on page 698, 698, book 11. Book 11 has only one canto, therefore the canto is not numbered. Book 11, the book of everlasting day. So page 698. Uh, line 965 onwards. O beautiful body of the incarnate word, thy thoughts are mine, I have spoken with thy voice. So now that she has passed through the test, she has not got tempted by her personal salvation, so she is told, O beautiful body, that's how the divine addresses Savitri, of the incarnate word, that is, of the word, word with a w, capital W, which means the word of the divine, Om, you might say, a beautiful body of the incarnate word, that is the word has got embodied, the Om itself has got embodied. O beautiful body of the incarnate word, thy thoughts are mine. What you have said, been saying all along that this is what I want, is also what I want. Your thoughts and my thoughts are the same. Thy thoughts are mine, I have spoken with thy voice. It is me who has spoken through this, that you want to change the character of the earth and so on. My will is thine. What thou hast chosen, I choose. All thou hast asked, I give to earth and men. So what you asked will be given to earth and men. Your choice and my choice is the same. And then after a few lines, she is told that you will be the instrument to do it. That's line 989. I'm just reading one line to save time. And lay my splendid yoke upon thy soul. I yoke thee to my power to work in time and then a few lines later and lay my splendid yoke upon thy soul. Yoke, you know, is like uh, that uh, binding uh, sort of a frame which you put on the uh, hump of an ox so that it can plow. So it's bound to that. So I yoke thee, that is, I have tied that around you to my power. So you are yoked, power will be mine and you'll do that work in time. The timeless is working through time. I yoke thee to my power of work in time. And then a few lines later in the same stanza, and lay my splendid yoke upon thy soul. So she has been yoked so that she'll be an instrument. But an instrument to do what? That comes on the next page, line 999. O oh, sun word, that's how Savitri has been addressed. It's a sort of a tr English translation of Savitri. O sun word, thou shalt raise the earth soul to light and bring down God into the lives of men. Earth shall be my work chamber and my house 
my garden of life to plant a seed divine. So, you are my instrument, you have been yoked to do what? To raise the earth soul to light, light with a capital L, to raise the very soul of earth to that light of the divine and bring down God into the lives of men. So, lift the earth up, that ascent, and then the descent from God into the lives of men so that their lives are organized differently, their lives are lived differently. Earth shall be my work chamber. Earth will be sort of the workshop. And my house, my garden of life to plant a seed divine. So this will be my kshetra, karma kshetra, karma bhumi, where all this will happen and it will be through you. You will be the instrument to do it. And uh, what will be the impact of it? I'll go a little faster. These lines are beautiful, but at the same time, they're also quite simple. Uh, when all thy work in human time is done, the mind of earth shall be a home of light. The life of earth a tree growing towards heaven, the body of earth a tabernacle of God. Awakened from the mortal's ignorance, men shall be lit with the eternal's ray and the glory of my sun lift in their thoughts and feel in their hearts the sweetness of my love and in their acts my power's miraculous drive. So this is what will happen to men. Men shall be lift with the eternal's ray. So they'll no longer be in darkness. They'll be lit up with the eternal's ray when this work is done. And... Uh, their thoughts will be uplifted, their feelings will be uplifted with love, and their acts, their, the, what they do, their work, will have the power's miraculous drive. My will shall be the meaning of their days. So my will and human will will coincide, living for me, by me, in me, they shall live. So this is what human life will be like when uh, Savitri's mission is accomplished. And, uh, and I'll close with uh, the Mahavakya of Savitri, which comes at the very end when uh, she's back after with Satyavan and uh, then uh, the rishis and all who meet her in the forest as she's returning to the palace, which uh, now Satyavan and Savitri's parents have as she's walking there. She's asked, tell us what is the final sort of message you would like to give as a result of all this exploration which you have gone through. And uh, she says this beautiful line, there are a few lines, maybe I'll read those four lines. Awakened to the meaning of my heart, that to feel love and oneness is to live, and this, the magic of our golden change, is all the truth I know or seek, O sage. So he's addressing the Rishi as a sage and telling him that uh, I have been awakened to the meaning of my heart. That is the true meaning of what truly the heart, the divinity residing in the heart is about. Once you are awakened to that, then there is a change. A change which can be called magic. The magic of our golden change. And that is all the truth I know or seek. That is all. So all great truths can be encapsulated sometimes. And, but then what is that line which uh, has that, which is the result of that magic change which can, and which is uh, the true meaning that she has discovered and all the truth which is encapsulated in? What is that line? That to feel love and oneness is to live. Is to live, that is, that is what makes life worth living. That is what makes life meaningful. What makes life meaningful? To feel love and oneness, which means to feel love, universal love, unconditional love, love that does not expect anything in return. That to feel love, but how will that love come? From oneness. To feel love and oneness is to live. So means to feel love, to express that love, love which has been inspired by oneness is truly to live, is true, is what? makes life truly worth living and meaningful. <laughs>